Part Two, Chapter Seven of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Two, Chapter Seven. An elegant carriage stood in the middle of the road with a pair of spirited gray horses. There was no one in it, and the coachman had got off his box and stood by. The horses were being held by the bridle. A mass of people had gathered round, the police standing in front. One of them held a lighted lantern which he was turning on something lying close to the wheels. Everyone was talking, shouting, exclaiming. The coachman seemed at a loss and kept repeating, "'What a misfortune! Good Lord! What a misfortune!' Raskolnikov pushed his way in as far as he could, and succeeded at last in seeing the object of the commotion and interest. On the ground a man who had been run over lay apparently unconscious, and covered with blood. He was very badly dressed, but not like a workman. Blood was flowing from his head and face. His face was crushed, mutilated, and disfigured. He was evidently badly injured. "'Merciful heaven!' wailed the coachman. What more could I do? If I had been driving fast or had not shouted to him, but I was going quietly, not in a hurry. Everyone could see I was going along just like everybody else. A drunken man can't walk straight, we all know. I saw him crossing the street, staggering and almost falling. I shouted again, and a second and a third time. Then I held the horses in, but he fell straight under their feet. Either he did it on purpose, or he was very tipsy. The horses are young and ready to take fright. They started. He screamed. That made them worse. That's how it happened." "'That's just how it was,' a voice in the crowd confirmed. "'He shouted. That's true. He shouted three times,' another voice declared. Three times it was. We all heard it,' shouted a third. But the coachman was not very much distressed and frightened. It was evident that the carriage belonged to a rich and important person who was awaiting it somewhere. The police, of course, were in no little anxiety to avoid upsetting his arrangements. All they had to do was to take the injured man to the police station and the hospital. No one knew his name. Meanwhile Raskolnikov had squeezed in and stooped closer over him. The lantern suddenly lighted up the unfortunate man's face. He recognized him. I know him. I know him!" he shouted, pushing to the front. It's a government clerk retired from the service, Marmeladov. He lives close by in Kozel's house. Make haste for a doctor. I will pay, see? He pulled money out of his pocket and showed it to the policeman. He was in violent agitation. The police were glad that they had found out who the man was. Raskolnikov gave his own name and address, and as earnestly as if it had been his father, he besought the police to carry the unconscious Marmeladov to his lodging at once. "'Just here, three houses away,' he said eagerly. "'The house belongs to Kozel, a rich German. He was going home, no doubt drunk. I know him. He is a drunkard. He has a family there, a wife, children. He has one daughter. It will take time to take him to the hospital, and there is sure to be a doctor in the house. I'll pay, I'll pay. At least he will be looked after at home. They will help him at once. But he'll die before you get him to the hospital." He managed to slip something unseen into the policeman's hand. But the thing was straightforward and legitimate, and in any case help was closer here. They raised the injured man, people volunteered to help. Kozel's house was thirty yards away. Raskolnikov walked behind, carefully holding Marmeladov's head and showing the way. This way! This way! We must take him upstairs head foremost. Turn round. I'll pay. I'll make it worth your while," he muttered. Katerina Ivanovna had just begun, as she always did at every free moment, walking to and fro in her little room from window to stove and back again, with her arms folded across her chest, talking to herself and coughing. Of late she had begun to talk more than ever to her eldest girl, Polenka, a child of ten who, though there was much she did not understand, understood very well that her mother needed her, 
and so always watched her with her big clever eyes and strove her utmost to appear to understand. This time Polenka was undressing her little brother, who had been unwell all day and was going to bed. The boy was waiting for her to take off his shirt, which had to be washed at night. He was sitting straight and motionless on a chair, with a silent, serious face, with his legs stretched out straight before him, heels together and toes turned out. He was listening to what his mother was saying to his sister, sitting perfectly still with pouting lips and wide open eyes, just as all good little boys have to sit when they are undressed to go to bed. A little girl, still younger, dressed literally in rags, stood at the screen, waiting for her turn. The door onto the stairs was open to relieve them a little from the clouds of tobacco smoke which floated in from the other rooms and brought on long terrible fits of coughing in the poor, consumptive woman. Katerina Ivanovna seemed to have grown even thinner during that week and the hectic flush on her face was brighter than ever. "'You wouldn't believe, you can't imagine, Polenka,' she said, walking about the room. "'What a happy, luxurious life we had in my papa's house, and how this drunkard has brought me and will bring you all to ruin. Papa was a civil colonel and only a step from being a governor, so that everyone who came to see him said, "'We look upon you, Ivan Mihalovich, as our governor.' When I... when... She coughed violently. "'Oh, cursed life!' she cried, clearing her throat and pressing her hands to her breast. "'When I... when, at the last ball, at the marshal's, Princess Besmelny saw me, who gave me the blessing when your father and I were married, Polenka, she asked at once, "'Isn't that the pretty girl who danced the shawl dance at the breaking up? You must mend that tear, you must take your needle and darn it as I showed you, or tomorrow... Cough, 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 he will make the hole bigger," she articulated with effort. Prince Shigolskoy, a hammer-junker, had just come from Pittsburgh then. He danced the mazurka with me and wanted to make me an offer next day, but I thanked him in flattering expressions and told him that my heart had long been another's. That other was your father, Polya. Papa was fearfully angry. Is the water ready? Give me the shirt and the stockings. Lida, said she to the youngest one, you must manage without your chemise tonight, and lay your stockings out with it. I'll wash them together. How is it that drunken vagabond doesn't come in? He has worn his shirt till it looks like a dish clout. He has torn it to rags. I do it all together, so as to not have to work two nights running. Oh, dear! Cough, 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 cough! Again! What's this? she cried, noticing a crowd in the passage, and the men who were pushing into her room, carrying a burden. "'What is it? What are they bringing? Mercy on us!' "'Where are we to put him?' asked the policeman, looking round when Marmeladov, unconscious and covered with blood, had been carried in. "'On the sofa. Put him straight on the sofa, with his head this way,' Raskolnikov showed him. "'Run over in the road. Drunk!' someone shouted in the passage. Katerina Ivanovna stood, turning white and gasping for breath. The children were terrified. Little Lida screamed, rushed to Polenka and clutched at her, trembling all over. Having laid Marmeladov down, Raskolnikov flew to Katerina Ivanovna. "'For God's sake, be calm! Don't be frightened!' he said, speaking quickly. "'He was crossing the road and was run over by a carriage. Don't be frightened! He will come too. I told them to bring here. I've been here already, you remember? He will come too. I'll pay." "'He's done it this time!' Katerina Ivanovna cried despairingly, and she rushed to her husband. Raskolnikov noticed at once that she was not one of those women who swoon easily. She instantly placed under the luckless man's head a pillow, which no one had thought of, and began undressing and examining him. She kept her head, forgetting herself, biting her trembling lips and stifling the screams which were ready to break from her. Raskolnikov, meanwhile, induced someone to run for a doctor. There was a doctor, it appeared, next door but one. "'I've sent for a doctor,' he kept assuring Katerina Ivanovna. "'Don't be uneasy. I'll pay. Haven't you water? And give me a napkin or a towel, anything, as quick as you can. 
He is injured, but not killed, believe me. We shall see what the doctor says." Katerina Ivanovna ran to the window. There, on a broken chair in the corner, a large earthenware basin full of water had been stood, in readiness for washing her children's and husband's linen that night. This washing was done by Katerina Ivanovna at night at least twice a week, if not oftener. For the family had come to such a pass that they were practically without change of linen, and Katerina Ivanovna could not endure uncleanliness, and rather than see dirt in the house, she preferred to wear herself out at night, working beyond her strength when the rest were asleep, so as to get the wet linen hung on a line and dry by the morning. She took up the basin of water at Raskolnikov's request, but almost fell down with her burden. But the latter had already succeeded in finding a towel, wetted it, and began washing the blood off Marmeladov's face. Katerina Ivanovna stood by, breathing painfully and pressing her hands to her breast. She was in need of attention herself. Raskolnikov began to realize that he might have made a mistake in having the injured man brought here. The policeman, too, stood in hesitation. Polinka! cried Katerina Ivanovna. Run to Sonia, make haste. If you don't find her at home, leave word that her father has been run over and that she is to come here at once, when she comes in. Run, Polenka. There, put on the shawl. Run your fastest, cried the little boy on the chair suddenly, after which he relapsed into the same dumb rigidity, with round eyes, his heels thrust forward and his toes spread out. Meanwhile the room had become so full of people that you couldn't have dropped a pin. The policemen left, all except one, who remained for a time, trying to drive out the people who came in from the stairs. Almost all Madame Lipoveshel's lodgers had streamed in from the inner rooms of the flat. At first they were squeezed together in the doorway, but afterwards they overflowed into the room. Katerina Ivanovna flew into a fury. "'You might let him die in peace, at least!' she shouted at the crowd. "'Is it a spectacle for you to gape at? With cigarettes? Cough, cough, cough! You might as well keep your hats on, and there is one in his hat. Get away! You should respect the dead, at least!' Her cough choked her, but her reproaches were not without result. They evidently stood in some awe of Katerina Ivanovna. The lodgers, one after another, squeezed back into the doorway with that strange inner feeling of satisfaction which may be observed in the presence of a sudden accident, even in those nearest and dearest to the victim, from which no living man is exempt, even in spite of the sincerest sympathy and compassion. Voices outside were heard, however, speaking of the hospital, and saying that they'd no business to make a disturbance here. "'No business to die!' cried Katerina Ivanovna, and she was rushing to the door to vent her wrath upon them, but in the doorway came face to face with Madame Lipoveshel, who had only just heard of the accident and ran in to restore order. She was a particularly quarrelsome and irresponsible German. "'Ah, my God!' she cried, clasping her hands. Your husband drunken horses have trampled. To the hospital with him. I am the landlady." "'Amelia Ludwigovna, I beg you to recollect what you are saying,' Katerina Ivanovna began haughtily. She always took a haughty tone with the landlady, that she might remember her place, and even now could not deny herself this satisfaction. "'Amelia Ludwigovna, I have you once before told you to call me Amelia Ludwigovna may not dare. I am Amelia Ivanovna." "'You are not Amelia Ivanovna, but Amelia Ludwigovna. And as I am not one of your despicable flatterers, like Mr. Lebeziatnikov, who's laughing behind the door at this moment—' A laugh and a cry of, "'They are at it again!' was in fact audible at the door. "'So I shall always call you Amelia Ludwigovna though I fail to understand why you dislike that name. You can see for yourself what has happened to Semyon Saharovitch. He is dying. I beg you to close that door at once and to admit no one. Let him at least die in peace. Or, I warn you, the Governor-General himself shall be informed of your conduct to-morrow. The Prince knew me as a girl. He remembers Semyon Saharovitch well, and has often been a benefactor to him. Everyone knows that Semyon Zaharovitch has many friends and protectors, 
whom he abandoned himself from an honorable pride, knowing his unhappy weakness. But now," she pointed to Raskolnikov, a generous young man has come to our assistance, who has wealth and connections and whom Semyon Saharovitch has known from a child. You may rest assured, Amelia Ludwigovna." All this was uttered with extreme rapidity, getting quicker and quicker, but a cough suddenly cut short Katerina Ivanovna's eloquence. At that instant the dying man recovered consciousness and uttered a groan. She ran to him. The injured man opened his eyes and without recognition or understanding gazed at Raskolnikov who was bending over him. He drew deep, slow, painful breaths. Blood oozed at the corners of his mouth and drops of perspiration came out on his forehead. Not recognizing Raskolnikov, he began looking round uneasily. Katerina Ivanovna looked at him with a sad but stern face, and tears trickled from her eyes. "'My God! His whole chest is crushed! How he is bleeding!' she said in despair. "'We must take off his clothes. Turn a little, Semyon Zaharovitch, if you can!' she cried to him. Marmeladov recognized her. "'A priest!' he articulated huskily. Katerina Ivanovna walked to the window, laid her head against the window-frame, and exclaimed in despair, "'Oh, cursed life!' "'A priest!' the dying man said again, after a moment's silence. "'They have gone for him!' Katerina Ivanovna shouted to him. He obeyed her shout and was silent. With sad and timid eyes he looked for her. She returned and stood by his pillow. He seemed a little easier, but not for long. Soon his eyes rested on little Lida, his favorite, who was shaking in the corner, as though she were in a fit, and staring at him with her wondering, childish eyes. Ah! He signed towards her uneasily. He wanted to say something. What now? cried Katerina Ivanovna. Barefoot! Barefoot! he muttered, indicating with frenzied eyes the child's bare feet. Be silent! Katerina Ivanovna cried irritably. You know why she is barefooted! Thank God! The doctor! exclaimed Raskolnikov, relieved. The doctor came in, a precise little old man, a German, looking about him mistrustfully. He went up to the sick man, took his pulse, carefully felt his head, and with the help of Katerina Ivanovna he unbuttoned the blood-stained shirt and bared the injured man's chest. It was gashed, crushed, and fractured. Several ribs on the right side were broken. On the left side, just over the heart, was a large, sinister-looking yellowish-black bruise, a cruel kick from the horse's hoof. The doctor frowned. The policeman told him that he was caught in the wheel and turned round with it for thirty yards on the road. "'It's wonderful that he has recovered consciousness,' the doctor whispered softly to Raskolnikov. "'What do you think of him?' he asked. "'He will die immediately. Is there really no hope? Not the faintest. He is at the last gasp. His head is badly injured, too. Hmm. I could bleed him if you like, but it would be useless. He is bound to die within the next five or ten minutes. Better bleed him, then. If you like, but I warn you it would be perfectly useless.' At that moment other steps were heard. The crowd in the passage parted, and the priest, a little gray old man, appeared in the doorway bearing the sacrament. A policeman had gone for him at the time of the accident. The doctor changed places with him, exchanging glances with him. Raskolnikov begged the doctor to remain a little while. He shrugged his shoulders and remained. All stepped back. The confession was soon over. The dying man probably understood little. He could only utter indistinct, broken sounds. Katerina Ivanovna took little Lida, lifted the boy from the chair, knelt down in the corner by the stove and made the children kneel in front of her. The little girl was still trembling, but the boy, kneeling on his little bare knees, lifted his hand rhythmically, crossing himself with precision, and bowed down, touching the floor with his forehead, which seemed to afford him especial satisfaction. Katerina Ivanovna bit her lips and held back her tears. She prayed too now, and then pulling straight the boy's shirt, and managed to cover the girl's bare shoulders with a kerchief, which she took from the chest without rising from her knees or ceasing to pray. 
Meanwhile the door from the inner rooms was opened inquisitively again. In the passage the crowd of spectators from all the flats on the staircase grew denser and denser, but they did not venture beyond the threshold. A single candle-end lighted up the scene. At that moment Polenka forced her way through the crowd at the door. She came in panting from running so fast, took off her kerchief, looked for her mother, went up to her and said, "'She is coming! I met her in the street!' Her mother made her kneel beside her. Timidly and noiselessly a young girl made her way through the crowd, and strange was her appearance in that room, in the midst of want, rags, death and despair. She too was in rags, her attire was all of the cheapest, but decked out in gutter finery of a special stamp, unmistakably betraying its shameful purpose. Sonia stopped short in the doorway and looked about her bewildered, unconscious of everything. She forgot her fourth-hand, gaudy silk dress, so unseemly here with its ridiculous long train, and her immense crinoline that filled up the whole doorway, and her light-colored shoes, and the parasol she brought with her, though it was no use at night, and the absurd round straw hat with its flaring, flame-colored feather. Under this rakishly tilted hat was a pale, frightened little face, with lips parted and eyes staring in terror. Sonia was a small thin girl of eighteen, with fair hair, rather pretty, with wonderful blue eyes. She looked intently at the bed and the priest. She too was out of breath with running. At last whispers, some words in the crowd probably, reached her. She looked down and took a step forward into the room, still keeping close to the door. The service was over. Katerina Ivanovna went up to her husband again. The priest stepped back and turned to say a few words of admonition and consolation to Katerina Ivanovna on leaving. "'What am I to do with these?' she interrupted sharply and irritably, pointing to the little ones. "'God is merciful. Look to the Most High for succor,' the priest began. "'Ah! He is merciful, but not to us.' "'That's a sin, a sin, madam,' observed the priest, shaking his head. And isn't that a sin?" cried Katerina Ivanovna, pointing to the dying man. Perhaps those who have involuntarily caused the accident will agree to compensate you, at least for the loss of his earnings. You don't understand," cried Katerina Ivanovna, angrily waving her hand. And why should they compensate me? Why, he was drunk and threw himself under the horses. What earnings! He brought us nothing but misery. He drank everything away, the drunkard. He robbed us to get drink. He wasted their lives and mine for drink. And thank God he's dying. One less to keep." "'You must forgive in the hour of death. That's a sin, madam. Such feelings are a great sin.' Katerina Ivanovna was busy with the dying man. She was giving him water, wiping the blood and sweat from his head setting his pillow straight, and had only turned now and then for a moment to address the priest. Now she flew at him almost in a frenzy. "'Ah, father! That's words, and only words! Forgive! If he'd not been run over, he'd have come home to-day drunk, and his only shirt dirty and in rags, and he'd have fallen asleep like a log, and I should have been sousing and rinsing till daybreak, washing his rags and the children's, and then drying them by the window, and as soon as it was daylight I should have been darning them. That's how I spend my nights. What's the use of talking of forgiveness? I have forgiven as it is." A terrible hollow cough interrupted her words. She put her handkerchief to her lips and showed it to the priest, pressing her other hand to her aching chest. The handkerchief was covered with blood. The priest bowed his head and said nothing. Marmeladov was in the last agony. He did not take his eyes off the face of Katerina Ivanovna, who was bending over him again. He kept trying to say something to her. He began moving his tongue with difficulty and articulating indistinctly, but Katerina Ivanovna, understanding that he wanted to ask her forgiveness, called peremptorily to him, "'Be silent! No need! I know what you want to say!' And the sick man was silent but at the same instant his wandering eyes strayed to the doorway and he saw Sonia. Till then he had not noticed her. She was standing in the shadow in a corner. 
Who's that? Who's that? He said suddenly in a thick, gasping voice, in agitation, turning his eyes in horror towards the door where his daughter was standing and trying to sit up. Lie down! Lie down! cried Katerina Ivanovna. With unnatural strength he had succeeded in propping himself on his elbow. He looked wildly and fixedly for some time on his daughter, as though not recognizing her. He had never seen her before in such attire. Suddenly he recognized her, crushed and ashamed in her humiliation and gaudy finery, meekly awaiting her turn to say good-bye to her dying father. His face showed intense suffering. "'Sonia! Daughter! Forgive!' he cried, and he tried to hold out his hand to her, but losing his balance he fell off the sofa, face downwards on the floor. They rushed to pick him up, they put him on the sofa. But he was dying. Sonia, with a faint cry, ran up, embraced him, and remained so without moving. He died in her arms. "'He's got what he wanted!' Katerina Ivanovna cried, seeing her husband's dead body. "'Well, what's to be done now? How am I to bury him? What can I give them tomorrow to eat?' Raskolnikov went up to Katerina Ivanovna. "'Katerina Ivanovna,' he began, "'last week your husband told me all his life and circumstances. Believe me, he spoke of you with passionate reverence. From that evening, when I learnt how devoted he was to you all, and how he loved and respected you especially, Katerina Ivanovna, in spite of his unfortunate weakness, from that evening we became friends. Allow me now to do something, to repay my debt to my dead friend. Here are twenty roubles, I think, and if that can be of any assistance to you, then I, in short, I will come again, and I will be sure to come again. I shall perhaps come again tomorrow. Good-bye." And he went quickly out of the room, squeezing his way through the crowd to the stairs. But in the crowd he suddenly jostled against Nicodem Fomitch, who had heard of the accident and had come to give instructions in person. They had not met since the scene at the police station, but Nicodem Fomitch knew him instantly. "'Ah, is that you?' he asked him. "'He's dead,' answered Raskolnikov. The doctor and the priest have been, and all as it should have been. Don't worry the poor woman too much, she is in consumption as it is. Try and cheer her up, if possible. You are a kind-hearted man, I know," he added with a smile, looking straight in his face. "'But you are spattered with blood,' observed Nicodem Fomitch, noticing in the lamplight some fresh stains on Raskolnikov's waistcoat. Yes. I'm covered with blood," Raskolnikov said with a peculiar air. Then he smiled, nodded, and went downstairs. He walked down slowly and deliberately, feverish but not conscious of it, entirely absorbed in a new overwhelming sensation of life and strength that surged up suddenly within him. This sensation might be compared to that of a man condemned to death who has suddenly been pardoned. Halfway down the staircase he was overtaken by the priest on his way home. Raskolnikov let him pass, exchanging a silent greeting with him. He was just descending the last steps, when he heard rapid footsteps behind him. Someone overtook him. It was Polenka. She was running after him, calling, "'Wait! Wait!' He turned round. She was at the bottom of the staircase and stopped short a step above him. A dim light came in from the yard. Raskolnikov could distinguish the child's thin but pretty little face, looking at him with a bright, childish smile. She had run after him with a message which she was evidently glad to give. "'Tell me, what is your name, and where do you live?' she said hurriedly in a breathless voice. He laid both hands on her shoulders and looked at her with a sort of rapture. It was such a joy to him to look at her he could not have said why. "'Who sent you?' "'Sister Sonia sent me,' answered the girl, smiling still more brightly. "'I knew it was Sister Sonia sent you. Mama sent me, too. When Sister Sonia was sending me, Mama came up, too, and said, "'Run fast, Polenka. "'Do you love Sister Sonia?' "'I love her more than anyone,' Polenka answered with a peculiar earnestness, and her smile became graver. "'And will you love me?' 
By way of answer he saw the little girl's face approaching him, her full lips naively held out to kiss him. Suddenly her arms as thin as sticks held him tightly, her head rested on his shoulder, and the little girl wept softly, pressing her face against him. "'I am sorry for father,' she said a moment later, raising her tear-stained face and brushing away the tears with her hands. "'It's nothing but misfortunes now,' she added suddenly, with that peculiarly sedate air which children try hard to assume when they try to speak like grown-up people. "'Did your father love you?' "'He loved Lida most,' she went on very seriously, without a smile, exactly like grown-up people. He loved her because she is little and because she is ill, too. And he always used to bring her presents. But he taught us to read and me grammar and scripture, too," she added with dignity. And Mother never used to say anything, but we knew that she liked it and Father knew it, too. And Mother wants to teach me French, for it's time my education began. And do you know your prayers? Of course we do. We knew them long ago. I say my prayers to myself, as I am a big girl now, but Kolya and Lida say them aloud with Mother. First they repeat the Ave Maria, and then another prayer. Lord forgive and bless Sister Sonia, and then another. Lord forgive and bless our second father. For our elder father is dead, and this is another one, but we do pray for the other as well. Polenka, my name is Rodian. Pray sometimes for me, too and thy servant Rodian, nothing more. I'll pray for you all the rest of my life," the little girl declared hotly, and suddenly smiling again, she rushed at him and hugged him warmly once more. Raskolnikov told her his name and address, and promised to be sure to come next day. The child went away quite enchanted with him. It was past ten when he came out into the street. In five minutes he was standing on the bridge at the spot where the woman had jumped in. Enough," he pronounced resolutely and triumphantly. I've done with fancies, imaginary terrors and phantoms. Life is real. Haven't I lived just now? My life has not yet died with that old woman. The kingdom of heaven to her! And now enough, madam, leave me in peace. Now for the reign of reason and light, and of will and of strength, and now we will see. We will try our strength he added defiantly, as though challenging some power of darkness. And I was ready to consent to live in a square of space. I am weak at this moment, but I believe my illness is all over. I knew it would be over when I went out. By the way, Pachinkov's house is only a few steps away. I certainly must go to Razumian, even if it were not close by. Let him win his bet. Let us give him some satisfaction, too no matter. Strength, strength is what one wants. You can get nothing without it. And strength must be won by strength. That's what they don't know," he added proudly and self-confidently, and he walked with flagging footsteps from the bridge. Pride and self-confidence grew continually stronger in him. He was becoming a different man every moment. What was it had happened to work this revolution in him? He did not know himself. Like a man catching at a straw, he suddenly felt that he too could live, that there was still life for him, that his life had not died with the old woman. Perhaps he was in too great a hurry with his conclusions, but he did not think of that. But I did ask her to remember thy servant Rodian in her prayers, the idea struck him. Well, that was in case of emergency, he added, and laughed himself at his boyish sally. He was in the best of spirits. He easily found Razumian. The new lodger was already known at Pachinkov's, and the porter at once showed him the way. Halfway upstairs, he could hear the noise and animated conversation of a big gathering of people. The door was wide open on the stairs. He could hear exclamations and discussion. Razumian's room was fairly large. The company consisted of fifteen people. Raskolnikov stopped in the entry where two of the landlady's servants were busy behind a screen with two samovars, bottles, plates and dishes of pie and savories, brought up from the landlady's kitchen. Raskolnikov sent in for Azumian. He ran out delighted. At the first glance it was apparent that he had had a great deal to drink, 
and, though no amount of liquor made Razumian quite drunk, this time he was perceptibly affected by it. Listen, Raskolnikov hastened to say, I've only just come to tell you you've won your bet and that no one really knows what may not happen to him. I can't come in, I am so weak that I shall fall down directly. And so good evening and good-bye. Come and see me tomorrow. Do you know what? I'll see you home. If you say you're weak yourself, you must. And your visitors? Who is the curly-headed one who has just peeped out? He? Goodness only knows. Some friend of uncle's, I expect. Or perhaps he has come without being invited. I'll leave uncle with them. He is an invaluable person. Pity I can't introduce you to him now. But confound them all now. They won't notice me, and I need a little fresh air, for you've come just in the nick of time. Another two minutes, and I should have come to blows. They are talking such a lot of wild stuff. You simply can't imagine what men will say. Though, why shouldn't you imagine? Don't we talk nonsense ourselves? And let them. That's the way to learn not to. Wait a minute. I'll fetch Zosimov. Zosimov pounced upon Raskolnikov almost greedily. He showed a special interest in him. Soon his face brightened. "'You must go to bed at once,' he pronounced, examining the patient as far as he could. "'And take something for the night. Will you take it? I've got it ready some time ago. A powder.' Two, if you like,' answered Raskolnikov. The powder was taken at once. "'It's a good thing you are taking him home.' observed Zosimov to Razumian. We shall see how he is tomorrow. Today he's not at all amiss. A considerable change since the afternoon. Live and learn. Do you know what Zosimov whispered to me when we were coming out? Razumian blurted out as soon as they were in the street. I won't tell you everything, brother, because they are such fools. Zosimov told me to talk freely to you on the way, and get you to talk freely to me and afterwards I am to tell him about it, for he's got a notion in his head that you are... mad or close on it. Only fancy, in the first place you've three times the brains he has, in the second, if you are not mad, you needn't care a hang that he has got such a wild idea, and thirdly, that piece of beef whose specialty is surgery has gone mad on mental diseases, and what's brought him to this conclusion about you was your conversation today with Zamatov. Zamatov told you all about it? Yes, and he did well. Now, I understand what it all means, and so does Zamatov. Well, the fact is, Rodya, the point is, I'm a little drunk now, but that's no matter. The point is that this idea, you understand, was just being hatched in their brains, you understand? That is, no one ventured to say it aloud, because the idea is too absurd and especially since the arrest of that painter, that bubble's burst and gone forever. But why are they such fools? I gave Zamatov a bit of thrashing at the time. That's between ourselves, brother. Please don't let out a hint that you know of it. I've noticed he is a ticklish subject. It was at Louise Ivanovna's. But today, today it's all cleared up. That Ilya Petrovich is at the bottom of it. He took advantage of your fainting at the police station but he is ashamed of it himself now. I know that." Raskolnikov listened greedily. Razumian was drunk enough to talk too freely. "'I fainted then because it was so close and the smell of paint,' said Raskolnikov. "'No need to explain that. And it wasn't the paint only. The fever had been coming on for a month. Zosimov testifies to that. But how crushed that boy is now, you wouldn't believe.' I am not worth his little finger, he says. Yours, he means. He has good feelings at times, brother. But the lesson, the lesson you gave him today in the Palais de Cristal, that was too good for anything. You frightened him at first, you know. He nearly went into convulsions. You almost convinced him again of the truth of all that hideous nonsense. And then you suddenly put out your tongue at him. There now, what do you make of it? It was perfect. He is crushed annihilated now. It was masterly by Jove, it's what they deserve. Ah, that I wasn't there. He was hoping to see you awfully. Porfiry too wants to make your acquaintance. Ah, he too. 
but why did they put me down as mad? Oh, not mad. I must have said too much, brother. What struck him, you see, was that only that subject seemed to interest you. Now it's clear why it did interest you, knowing all the circumstances, and how that irritated you and worked in with your illness. I am a little drunk, brother, only, confound him, he has some idea of his own. I tell you, he's mad on mental diseases. But don't you mind him." For half a minute both were silent. "'Listen, Razumian,' began Raskolnikov, "'I want to tell you plainly. I've just been at a deathbed, a clerk who died. I gave him all my money, and besides, I've just been kissed by someone who, if I had killed anyone, would just the same. In fact, I saw someone else there, with a flame-colored feather. But I am talking nonsense. I am very weak. Support me. We shall be at the stairs directly." "'What's the matter? What's the matter with you?' Razumian asked anxiously. "'I am a little giddy, but that's not the point. I am so sad, so sad, like a woman. Look, what's that? Look, look! What is it? Don't you see? A light in my room, you see! Through the crack!" They were already at the foot of the last flight of stairs, at the level of the landlady's door, and they could, as a fact, see from below that there was a light in Raskolnikov's garret. "'Queer! Nastasia, perhaps,' observed Razumian. "'She is never in my room at this time and she must be in bed long ago, but I don't care. Good-bye." "'What do you mean? I am coming with you. We'll come in together.' "'I know we are going in together, but I want to shake hands here and say good-bye to you here. So give me your hand. Good-bye.' "'What's the matter with you, Rodya?' "'Nothing. Come along. You shall be witness.' They began mounting the stairs and the idea struck Razumian that perhaps Zosimov might be right after all. "'Ah, I've upset him with my chatter,' he muttered to himself. When they reached the door they heard voices in the room. "'What is it?' cried Razumian. Raskolnikov was the first to open the door. He flung it wide and stood still in the doorway, dumbfoundered. His mother and sister were sitting on his sofa and had been waiting an hour and a half for him. Why had he never expected? never thought of them, though the news that they had started were on their way and would arrive immediately had been repeated to him only that day. They had spent that hour and a half plying Nastasia with questions. She was standing before them and had told them everything by now. They were beside themselves with alarm when they heard of his running away today, ill and, as they understood from her story, delirious. Good heavens! What had become of him? Both had been weeping both had been in anguish for that hour and a half. A cry of joy, of ecstasy, greeted Raskolnikov's entrance. Both rushed to him. But he stood like one dead. A sudden, intolerable sensation struck him like a thunderbolt. He did not lift his arms to embrace them. He could not. His mother and sister clasped him in their arms, kissed him, laughed and cried. He took a step, tottered, and fell to the ground, fainting. Anxiety, cries of horror, moans. Razumian, who was standing in the doorway, flew into the room, seized the sick man in his strong arms, and in a moment had laid him on the sofa. "'It's nothing, nothing!' he cried to the mother and sister. "'It's only a faint, a mere trifle. Only just now the doctor said he was much better, that he is perfectly well. Water! See, he is coming to himself, he is all right again!' and, seizing Dona by the arm so that he almost dislocated it, he made her bend down to see that he is all right again. The mother and sister looked on him with emotion and gratitude as their providence. They had heard already from Nastasia all that had been done for their Rodya during his illness, by this very competent young man, as Pulcheria Alexandrovna Raskolnikov called him that evening in conversation with Dona. End of Part 2, Chapter 7。Part 3, Chapter 1 of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett.
1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Three, Chapter One. Raskolnikov got up and sat down on the sofa. He waved his hand weakly to Razumian to cut short the flow of warm and incoherent consolations he was addressing to his mother and sister, took them both by the hand, and for a minute or two gazed from one to the other without speaking. His mother was alarmed by his expression. It revealed an emotion agonizingly poignant, and at the same time something immovable, almost insane. Pulcheria Alexandrovna began to cry. Avdotya Romanovna was pale, her hand trembled in her brother's. "'Go home, with him,' he said in a broken voice, pointing to Razumian. "'Good-bye till tomorrow. Tomorrow everything... Is it long since you arrived?' "'This evening, Rodya,' answered Pulcheria Alexandrovna. "'The train was awfully late.' "'But, Rodya, nothing would induce me to leave you now. I will spend the night here, near you." "'Don't torture me,' he said with a gesture of irritation. "'I will stay with him,' cried Razumian. "'I won't leave him for a moment. Bother all my visitors. Let them rage to their heart's content. My uncle is presiding there.' "'How, how can I thank you?' Pulcheria Alexandrovna was beginning, once more pressing Razumian's hands but Raskolnikov interrupted her again. "'I can't have it! I can't have it!' he repeated irritably. "'Don't worry me! Enough! Go away! I can't stand it!' "'Come, Mama, come out of the room at least for a minute,' Donya whispered in dismay. "'We are distressing him, that's evident.' "'Mayn't I look at him after three years?' wept Pulcheria Alexandrovna. Stay! He stopped them again. You keep interrupting me, and my ideas get muddled. Have you seen Luzhin? No, Rodya, but he knows already of our arrival. We have heard, Rodya, that Pyotr Petrovich was so kind as to visit you today, Pulcheria Alexandrovna added somewhat timidly. Yes, he was so kind. Donya, I promised Luzhin I'd throw him downstairs and told him to go to hell. Rodya, what are you saying? Surely you don't mean to tell us. Pulcheria Alexandrovna began in alarm, but she stopped looking at Donya. Avdotya Romanovna was looking attentively at her brother, waiting for what would come next. Both of them had heard of the quarrel from Nastasia, so far as she had succeeded in understanding and reporting it, and were in painful perplexity and suspense. Donya. Raskolnikov continued with an effort. I don't want that marriage. So at the first opportunity tomorrow you must refuse Luzhin, so that we may never hear his name again." "'Good heavens!' cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna. "'Brother, think what you are saying!' Avdotya Romanovna began impetuously, but immediately checked herself. "'You are not fit to talk now. Perhaps you are tired,' she added gently. You think I am delirious? No, you are marrying Luzhin for my sake. But I won't accept the sacrifice. And so write a letter before tomorrow, to refuse him. Let me read it in the morning, and that will be the end of it." "'That I can't do,' the girl cried, offended. "'What right have you?' "'Donya, you are hasty, too. Be quiet. Tomorrow. Don't you see?' the mother interposed in dismay better come away." "'He is raving,' Razumian cried tipsily. "'Or how would he dare? Tomorrow all this nonsense will be over. Today he certainly did drive him away. That was so. And Luzhin got angry, too. He made speeches here, wanted to show off his learning, and he went out crestfallen.' "'Then it's true?' cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna. Goodbye till tomorrow, brother," said Donya compassionately. "Let us go, mother. Goodbye, Rodya." "Do you hear, sister?" he repeated after them, making a last effort. "I am not delirious. This marriage is an infamy. Let me act like a scoundrel, but you mustn't. 
one is enough. And though I am a scoundrel, I wouldn't own such a sister. It's me or Lusion. Go now." "'But you're out of your mind, despot!' roared Razumian. But Raskolnikov did not and perhaps could not answer. He lay down on the sofa and turned to the wall, utterly exhausted. Avdotya Romanovna looked with interest at Razumian. Her black eyes flashed. Razumian positively started at her glance. Pulcheria Alexandrovna stood overwhelmed. "'Nothing would induce me to go,' she whispered in despair to Razumian. "'I will stay somewhere here. Escort Donya home.' "'You'll spoil everything,' Razumian answered in the same whisper, losing patience. "'Come out onto the stairs, anyway. Nastasia, show a light. I assure you,' he went on in a half-whisper on the stairs, "'that he was almost beating the doctor in me this afternoon. Do you understand?' the doctor himself. Even he gave way and left him, so as not to irritate him. I remained downstairs on guard, but he dressed at once and slipped off. And he will slip off again if you irritate him, at this time of night, and will do himself some mischief." "'What are you saying?' "'And Avadotya Romanovna can't possibly be left in those lodgings without you. Just think where you are staying. That blackguard Pyotr Petrovitch couldn't find you better lodgings. But you know I've had a little to drink, and that's what makes me... swear. Don't mind it." "'But I'll go to the landlady here,' Pulcheria Alexandrovna insisted. "'I'll beseech her to find some corner for Donya and me for the night. I can't leave him like that. I cannot!' This conversation took place on the landing just before the landlady's door. Nastasia lighted them from a step below. Razumian was in extraordinary excitement. Half an hour earlier, while he was bringing Raskolnikov home, he had indeed talked too freely, but he was aware of it himself, and his head was clear in spite of the vast quantities he had imbibed. Now he was in a state bordering on ecstasy, and all that he had drunk seemed to fly to his head with redoubled effect. He stood with the two ladies seizing both by their hands, persuading them and giving them reasons with astonishing plainness of speech, and at almost every word he uttered, probably to emphasize his arguments, he squeezed their hands painfully as in a vice. He stared at Avotya Romanovna without the least regard for good manners. They sometimes pulled their hands out of his huge bony paws, but far from noticing what was the matter, he drew them all the closer to him. If they told him to jump head foremost from the staircase, he would have done it without thought or hesitation in their service. Though Pulcheria Alexandrovna felt that the young man was really too eccentric and pinched her hand too much, in her anxiety over Herodia she looked on his presence as providential, and was unwilling to notice all his peculiarities. But though Avdotya Romanovna shared her anxiety, and was not of timorous disposition, she could not see the glowing light in his eyes without wonder and almost alarm. It was only the unbounded confidence inspired by Nastasia's account of her brother's queer friend which prevented her from trying to run away from him and to persuade her mother to do the same. She realized, too, that even running away was perhaps impossible now. Ten minutes later, however, she was considerably reassured. It was characteristic of Razumian that he showed his true nature at once whatever mood he might be in, so that people quickly saw the sort of man they had to deal with. "'You can't go to the landlady! That's perfect nonsense!' he cried. "'If you stay, though you are his mother, you'll drive him to a frenzy, and then goodness knows what will happen. Listen, I'll tell you what I'll do. Nastasia will stay with him now, and I'll conduct you both home. You can't be in the streets alone.' Petersburg is an awful place in that way. But no matter. Then I'll run straight back here, and a quarter of an hour later, on my word of honor, I'll bring you news how he is, whether he is asleep and all that. Then listen. Then I'll run home in a twinkling. I've a lot of friends there, all drunk. I'll fetch Zosimov. That's the doctor who is looking after him. He is there, too. But he is not drunk. 
He is not drunk. He is never drunk. I'll drag him to Rodia, and then to you, so that you'll get two reports in the hour. From the doctor, you understand. From the doctor himself. That's a very different thing from my account of him. If there's anything wrong, I swear I'll bring you here myself. But if it's all right, you go to bed. And I'll spend the night here, in the passage. He won't hear me, and I'll tell Zosimov to sleep at the landlady's, to be at hand. Which is better for him, you or the doctor? So come home, then. But the landlady is out of the question. It's all right for me, but it's out of the question for you. She wouldn't take you, for she's... for she's a fool. She'd be jealous on my account of Avdotya Romanovna, and of you, too, if you want to know. Of Avdotya Romanovna, certainly. She is an absolutely, absolutely unaccountable character. But I am a fool, too. No matter. Come along. Do you trust me? Come, do you trust me or not? Let's go, mother, said Avdotya Romanovna. He will certainly do what he has promised. He has saved Rodya already, and if the doctor really will consent to spend the night here, what could be better? You see, you, you, understand me, because you are an angel, Razumian cried in ecstasy. Let us go. Nastasia, fly upstairs and sit with him with a light. I'll come in a quarter of an hour. Though Polcheria Alexandrovna was not perfectly convinced, she made no further resistance. Razumian gave an arm to each and drew them down the stairs. He still made her uneasy, as though he was competent and good-natured, was he capable of carrying out his promise? He seemed in such a condition. "'Ah, I see you think I am in such a condition!' Razumian broke in upon her thoughts, guessing them as he strolled along the pavement with huge steps so that the two ladies could hardly keep up with him, a fact he did not observe, however. "'Nonsense! That is, I am drunk like a fool, but that's not it. I am not drunk from wine. It seeing you has turned my head. But don't mind me. Don't take any notice. I am talking nonsense. I am not worthy of you. I am utterly unworthy of you. The minute I've taken you home, I'll pour a couple of pailfuls of water over my head in the gutter here, and then I shall be all right. If only you knew how I love you both! Don't laugh, and don't be angry. You may be angry with anyone, but not with me. I am his friend, and therefore I am your friend, too. I want to be. I had a presentiment. Last year there was a moment, though it wasn't a presentiment, really, for you seem to have fallen from heaven. And I expect I shan't sleep all night. Zosimov was afraid a little time ago that he would go mad. That's why he mustn't be irritated." "'What did you say?' cried the mother. "'Did the doctor really say that?' asked Avdotya Romanovna, alarmed. "'Yes, but it's not so. Not a bit of it. He gave him some medicine, a powder. I saw it. And then you're coming here. Ah, it would have been better if you had come tomorrow. It's a good thing we went away. And in an hour Zosimov himself will report to you about everything. He is not drunk. And I shan't be drunk. And what made me get so tight? Because they got me into an argument, damn them! I've sworn never to argue. They talk such trash. I almost came to blows. I have left my uncle to preside. Would you believe they insist on complete absence of individualism, and that's just what they relish? Not to be themselves, to be as unlike themselves as they can. That's what they regard as the highest point of progress. If only their nonsense were their own, but as it is... Listen, Polcheria Alexandrovna interrupted timidly, but it only added fuel to the flames. What do you think? shouted Razumian, louder than ever. You think I am attacking them for talking nonsense? Not a bit. I like them to talk nonsense. That's man's one privilege over all creation. Through error you come to the truth. 
I am a man because I err. You never reach any truth without making fourteen mistakes, and very likely a hundred and fourteen. And a fine thing, too, in its way. But we can't even make mistakes on our own account. Talk nonsense, but talk your own nonsense, and I'll kiss you for it. To go wrong in one's own way is better than to go right in someone else's. In the first case you are a man, in the second you're no better than a bird. Truth won't escape you, but life can be cramped. There have been examples. And what are we doing now? In science, development, thought, invention, ideals, aims, liberalism, judgment, experience, and everything. Everything, everything, we are still in the preparatory class at school. We prefer to live on other people's ideas. It's what we are used to. Am I right? Am I right? cried Resumian, pressing and shaking the two ladies' hands. Oh, mercy, I do not know, cried poor Pulcheria Alexandrovna. Yes, yes, though I don't agree with you in everything added Avdotya Romanovna earnestly, and at once uttered a cry, for he squeezed her hand so painfully. "'Yes, you say yes. Well, after that you—you—' he cried in a transport. "'You are a fount of goodness, purity, sense, and perfection. Give me your hand. You give me yours, too. I want to kiss your hands, here at once, on my knees and he fell on his knees on the pavement, fortunately at that time deserted. "'Leave off, I entreat you. What are you doing?' Pulcheria Alexandrovna cried, greatly distressed. "'Get up! Get up!' said Donya, laughing, though she too was upset. "'Not for anything till you let me kiss your hands. That's it. Enough. I get up and we'll go on. I am a luckless fool.' I am unworthy of you, and drunk, and I am ashamed. I am not worthy to love you, but to do homage to you is the duty of every man who is not a perfect beast. And I've done homage. Here are your lodgings, and for that alone Rodya was right in driving your Pyotr Petrovitch away. How dare he! How dare he put you in such lodgings! It's a scandal! Do you know the sort of people they take in here? and you his betrothed. You are his betrothed? Yes, well then, I'll tell you, your fiancé is a scoundrel." "'Excuse me, Mr. Razumian, you are forgetting,' Polcheria Alexandrovna was beginning. "'Yes, yes, you are right. I did forget myself. I am ashamed of it,' Razumian made haste to apologize. "'But—but but you can't be angry with me for speaking so for I speak sincerely, and not because... Hmm, hmm, that would be disgraceful. In fact, not because I'm in... Hmm, well, anyway, I won't say why, I daren't. But we all saw today when he came in that that man is not of our sort. Not because he had his hair curled at the barber's, not because he was in such a hurry to show his wit, but because he is a spy a speculator, because he is a skinflint and a buffoon. That's evident. Do you think him clever? No, he is a fool, a fool. And is he a match for you? Good heavens! Do you see, ladies?" He stopped suddenly on the way upstairs to their rooms. Though all my friends there are drunk, yet they are all honest, and though we do talk a lot of trash, and I do too, Yet we shall talk our way to the truth at last, for we are on the right path, while Pyotr Petrovitch is not on the right path. Though I've been calling them all sorts of names just now, I do respect them all. Though I don't respect Zamatov, I like him, for he is a puppy, and that bullock Zasimov because he is an honest man and knows his work. But enough, it's all said and forgiven. Is it forgiven? Well, then, let's go on. I know this corridor. I've been here. There was a scandal here at number three. Where are you here? Which number? Eight? Well, lock yourselves in for the night, then. Don't let anybody in. In a quarter of an hour I'll come back with news, 
and half an hour later I'll bring Zosimov, you'll see. Goodbye, I'll run." "'Good heavens, Donya, what is going to happen?' said Polcheria Alexandrovna, addressing her daughter with anxiety and dismay. "'Don't worry yourself, mother,' said Donya, taking off her hat and cape. "'God has sent this gentleman to our aid, though he has come from a drinking party. We can depend on him, I assure you, and all that he has done for Rodya. Ah, Donya, goodness knows whether he will come. How could I bring myself to leave Rodya? And how different, how different I had fancied our meeting! How sullen he was, as though not pleased to see us!" Tears came into her eyes. "'No, it's not that, mother. You didn't see, you were crying all the time. He is quite unhinged by serious illness, that's the reason. Ah, that illness! What will happen, what will happen? And how he talked to you, Donya," said the mother, looking timidly at her daughter, trying to read her thoughts, and already half consoled by Donya standing up for her brother, which meant that she had already forgiven him. I am sure he will think better of it tomorrow," she added, probing her further. And I am sure that he will say the same tomorrow, about that," Avdotya Romanovna said finally. And of course there was no going beyond that, for this was a point which Polcheria Alexandrovna was afraid to discuss. Donya went up and kissed her mother. The latter warmly embraced her without speaking. Then she sat down to wait anxiously for Razumian's return timidly watching her daughter who walked up and down the room with her arms folded, lost in thought. This walking up and down when she was thinking was a habit of Avdotya Romanovna's, and the mother was always afraid to break in on her daughter's mood at such moments. Razumian, of course, was ridiculous in his sudden drunken infatuation for Avdotya Romanovna. Yet apart from his eccentric condition, Many people would have thought it justified if they had seen Avdotya Romanovna, especially at that moment when she was walking to and fro with folded arms, pensive and melancholy. Avdotya Romanovna was remarkably good-looking. She was tall, strikingly well-proportioned, strong and self-reliant. The latter quality was apparent in every gesture, though it did not in the least detract from the grace and softness of her movements. In face she resembled her brother, but she might be described as really beautiful. Her hair was dark brown, a little lighter than her brother's. There was a proud light in her almost black eyes, and yet at times a look of extraordinary kindness. She was pale, but it was a healthy pallor. Her face was radiant with freshness and vigor. Her mouth was rather small. The full red lower lip projected a little, as did her chin. It was the only irregularity in her beautiful face, but it gave it a peculiarly individual and almost haughty expression. Her face was always more serious and thoughtful than gay. But how well smiles, how well youthful, light-hearted, irresponsible laughter suited her face! It was natural enough that a warm, open, simple-hearted honest giant like Razumian, who had never seen anyone like her and was not quite sober at the time, should lose his head immediately. Besides, as chance would have it, he saw Donya for the first time transfigured by her love for her brother, and her joy at meeting him. Afterwards he saw her lower lip quiver with indignation at her brother's insolent, cruel, and ungrateful words, and his fate was sealed. He had spoken the truth, moreover, when he blurted out in his drunken talk on the stairs that Praskovia Pavlovna, Raskolnikov's eccentric landlady, would be jealous of Pulcheria Alexandrovna as well as of Avdotna Romanovna on his account. Although Pulcheria Alexandrovna was forty-three, her face still retained traces of her former beauty. She looked much younger than her age, indeed, which is almost always the case with women who retain serenity of spirit, sensitiveness, and pure sincere warmth of heart to old age. We may add in parenthesis that to preserve all this is the only means of retaining beauty to old age. Her hair had begun to grow gray and thin, there had long been little crow's-foot wrinkles around her eyes, 
Her cheeks were hollow and sunken from anxiety and grief, and yet it was a handsome face. She was Donia over again, twenty years older, but without the projecting under lip. Pulcheria Alexandrovna was emotional, but not sentimental, timid and yielding, but only to a certain point. She could give way and accept a great deal even of what was contrary to her convictions, but there was a certain barrier fixed by honesty, principle and the deepest convictions which nothing would induce her to cross. Exactly twenty minutes after Razumian's departure, there came two subdued but hurried knocks at the door. He had come back. "'I won't come in. I haven't time,' he hastened to say when the door was opened. "'He sleeps like a top, soundly, quietly, and God grant he may sleep ten hours. Nastasia's with him. I told her not to leave till I came. Now I am fetching Zosimov. He will report to you, and then you'd better turn in. I can see you are too tired to do anything.' And he ran off down the corridor. "'What a very competent and devoted young man!' cried Polcheria Alexandrovna, exceedingly delighted. "'He seems a splendid person,' Evdotya Romanovna replied with some warmth, resuming her walk up and down the room. It was nearly an hour later when they heard footsteps in the corridor, and another knock at the door. Both women waited this time completely relying on Razumian's promise. He actually had succeeded in bringing Zosimov. Zosimov had agreed at once to desert the drinking party to go to Raskolnikov's, but he came reluctantly and with the greatest suspicion to see the ladies, mistrusting Razumian in his exhilarated condition. But his vanity was at once reassured and flattered. He saw that they were really expecting him as an oracle. He stayed just ten minutes and succeeded in completely convincing and comforting Pulcheria Alexandrovna. He spoke with marked sympathy, but with the reserve and extreme seriousness of a young doctor at an important consultation. He did not utter a word on any other subject, and did not display the slightest desire to enter into more personal relations with the two ladies. Remarking at his first entrance the dazzling beauty of Avdotya Romanovna, he endeavoured not to notice her at all during his visit, and addressed himself solely to Pulcheria Alexandrovna. All this gave him extraordinary inward satisfaction. He declared that he thought the invalid at this moment going on very satisfactorily. According to his observations, the patient's illness was due partly to his unfortunate material surroundings during the last few months, but it had partly also a moral origin. Was, so to speak, the product of several material and moral influences, anxieties, apprehensions, troubles, certain ideas, and so on. Noticing stealthily that Avdotya Romanovna was following his words with close attention, Zosimov allowed himself to enlarge on this theme. On Pulcheria Alexandrovna's anxiously and timidly inquiring as to some suspicion of insanity, he replied with a composed and candid smile that his words had been exaggerated, that certainly the patient had some fixed idea, something approaching a monomania. He, Zosimov, was now particularly studying this interesting branch of medicine. But that it must be recollected that, until today, the patient had been in delirium, and, and that no doubt the presence of his family would have a favourable effect on his recovery and distract his mind. If only all fresh shocks can be avoided," he added significantly. Then he got up, took leave with an impressive and affable bow, while blessings, warm gratitude and entreaties were showered upon him, and Avadotya Romanovna spontaneously offered her hand to him. He went out exceedingly pleased with his visit and still more so with himself. "'We'll talk tomorrow. Go to bed at once,' Razumian said in conclusion, following Zosimov out. "'I'll be with you tomorrow morning as early as possible with my report.' "'That's a fetching little girl, Avdotya Romanovna,' remarked Zosimov, almost licking his lips as they both came out into the street. "'Fetching?' "'You said fetching?' roared Razumian, and he flew at Zosimov and seized him by the throat. 
If you ever dare! Do you understand? Do you understand?" he shouted, shaking him by the collar and squeezing him against the wall. Do you hear? Let me go, you drunken devil! said Zosimov, struggling, and when he had let him go, he stared at him and went off into a sudden guffaw. Resumian stood facing him in gloomy and earnest reflection. Of course, I am an ass, he observed, somber as a storm cloud. But still, you are another. No, brother, not at all such another. I am not dreaming of any folly. They walked along in silence, and only when they were close to Raskolnikov's lodgings, Razumian broke the silence in considerable anxiety. Listen, he said, you're a first rate foe, but among your other failings, you're a loose fish, that I know, and a dirty one, too. You're a feeble, nervous wretch, and a mass of whims. You're getting fat and lazy and can't deny yourself anything. And I call that dirty because it leads one straight into the dirt. You've let yourself get so slack that I don't know how it is you're still a good, even a devoted doctor. You, a doctor, sleep on a feather bed and get up at night to your patients. In another three or four years you won't get up for your patients. But hang it all, that's not the point. You are going to spend tonight in the landlady's flat here. Hard work I've had to persuade her. And I'll be in the kitchen. So here's a chance for you to get to know her better. It's not what you think. There's not a trace of anything of the sort, brother. But I don't think. Here you have modesty, brother, silence, bashfulness, a savage virtue. And yet she's sighing and melting like wax simply melting. Save me from her, by all that's unholy. She's most prepossessing. I'll repay you. I'll do anything." Zosimov laughed more violently than ever. "'Well, you are smitten. But what am I to do with her?' "'It won't be much trouble, I assure you. Talk any rot you like to her, as long as you sit by her and talk. You're a doctor, too. Try curing her of something. I swear you won't regret it. She has a piano, and you know, I strum a little. I have a song there, a genuine Russian one. I shed hot tears. She likes the genuine article. And well, it all began with that song. Now you're a regular performer, a maitre, a Rubenstein. I assure you, you won't regret it. But have you made her some promise? Something signed? A promise of marriage, perhaps? Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing of the kind. Besides, she is not that sort at all. Cheborov tried that. Well, then, drop her. But I can't drop her like that. Why can't you? Well, I can't. That's all about it. There's an element of attraction here, brother. Then why have you fascinated her? I haven't fascinated her. Perhaps I was fascinated myself in my folly. But she won't care a straw whether it's you or I, so long as somebody sits beside her, sighing. I can't explain the position, brother. Look here. You are good at mathematics and working at it now. Begin teaching her the integral calculus. Upon my soul, I'm not joking. I'm in earnest. It'll be just the same to her. She will gaze at you and sigh for a whole year together. I talked to her once for two days at a time about the Prussian House of Lords, for one must talk of something. She just sighed and perspired. And you mustn't talk of love. She's bashful to hysterics. But just let her see you can't tear yourself away. That's enough. It's fearfully comfortable. You're quite at home. You can read, sit, lie about, write. You may even venture on a kiss if you're careful. But what do I want with her? Ah, I can't make you understand. You see, you are made for each other. I have often been reminded of you. You'll come to it in the end. So does it matter whether it's sooner or later? Here's the feather-bed element here, brother. Ah, and not only that. 
There's an attraction here. Here you have the end of the world, an anchorage, a quiet haven, the navel of the earth, the three fishes that are the foundation of the world, the essence of pancakes, of savory fish pies, of the evening samovar, of soft sighs and warm shawls, and hot stoves to sleep on, as snug as though you were dead, and yet you're alive, the advantages of both at once. Well, hang it, brother, what stuff I'm talking, it's bedtime. Listen, I sometimes wake up at night, so I'll go in and look at him. But there's no need, it's all right. Don't you worry yourself, yet if you like, you might just look in once too. But if you notice anything, delirium or fever, wake me at once. But there can't be. End of Part 3, Chapter 1《Part Three, Chapter Two of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Three, Chapter Two. Resuming waked up next morning at eight o'clock, troubled and serious. He found himself confronted with many new and unlooked-for perplexities. He had never expected that he would ever wake up feeling like that. He remembered every detail of the previous day, and he knew that a perfectly novel experience had befallen him, that he had received an impression unlike anything he had known before. At the same time he recognized clearly that the dream which had fired his imagination was hopelessly unattainable, so unattainable that he felt positively ashamed of it and he hastened to pass to the other more practical cares and difficulties bequeathed him by that thrice-accursed yesterday. The most awful recollection of the previous day was the way he had shown himself base and mean, not only because he had been drunk, but because he had taken advantage of the young girl's position to abuse her fiancé in his stupid jealousy, knowing nothing of their mutual relations and obligations, and next to nothing of the man himself and what right had he to criticize him in that hasty and unguarded manner? Who had asked for his opinion? Was it thinkable that such a creature as Avdotya Romanovna would be marrying an unworthy man for money? So there must be something in him. The lodgings? But, after all, how could he know the character of the lodgings? He was furnishing a flat. Foo! How despicable it all was! And what justification was it that he was drunk? Such a stupid excuse was even more degrading. In wine is truth, and the truth had all come out, that is, all the uncleanness of his coarse and envious heart. And would such a dream ever be permissible to him, Resumian? What was he beside such a girl, he, the drunken, noisy braggart of last night? Was it possible to imagine so absurd and cynical a juxtaposition? Resumian blushed desperately at the very idea and suddenly the recollection forced itself vividly upon him of how he had said last night on the stairs that the landlady would be jealous of Avdotya Romanovna. That was simply intolerable. He brought his fist down heavily on the kitchen stove, hurt his hand, and sent one of the bricks flying. "'Of course,' he muttered to himself a minute later with a feeling of self-abasement, "'of course all these infamies can never be wiped out or smoothed over.' and so it's useless even to think of it, and I must go to them in silence and do my duty, in silence too, and not ask forgiveness, and say nothing, for all is lost now." And yet, as he dressed, he examined his attire more carefully than usual. He hadn't another suit. If he had had, perhaps he wouldn't have put it on. I would have made a point of not putting it on but in any case he could not remain a cynic and a dirty sloven. He had no right to offend the feelings of others, especially when they were in need of his assistance and asking him to see them. He brushed his clothes carefully. His linen was always decent. In that respect he was especially clean. He washed that morning scrupulously. He got some soap from Nastasia. He washed his hair, his neck, and especially his hands. When it came to the question whether to shave his stubby chin or not, 
Praskovia Pavlovna had capital razors that had been left by her late husband. The question was angrily answered in the negative. Let it stay as it is. What if they think that I shaved on purpose, too? They certainly would think so. Not on any account. And the worst of it was, he was so coarse, so dirty, he had the manners of a pothouse, and and even admitting that he knew he had some of the essentials of a gentleman, what was there in that to be proud of? Everything ought to be a gentleman, and more than that. And all the same, he remembered, he too had done little things, not exactly dishonest, and yet... And what thoughts he sometimes had! Hm! And to set all that beside Avdotya Romanovna! Confound it! So be it! Well, he make a point, then, of being dirty, greasy, pothouse in his manners, and he wouldn't care. He'd be worse." He was engaged in such monologues when Zosimov, who had spent the night in Praskovia Pavlovna's parlour, came in. He was going home and was in a hurry to look at the invalid first. Razumihin informed him that Raskolnikov was sleeping like a dormouse. Zosimov gave orders that they shouldn't wake him and promised to see him again about eleven. If he is still at home, he added, damn it all, if one can't control one's patients, how is one to cure them? Do you know whether he will go to them, or whether they are coming here?" They are coming, I think, said Razumihin, understanding the object of the question. And they will discuss their family affairs, no doubt. I'll be off. You as the doctor have more right to be there than I. But I am not a father-confessor. I shall come and go away. I've plenty to do besides looking after them." "'One thing worries me,' interposed Razumihin, frowning. "'On the way home I talked a lot of drunken nonsense to him, all sorts of things, and amongst them that you were afraid that he might become insane. You told the ladies so, too. I know it was stupid. You may beat me if you like. Did you think so seriously?' That's nonsense, I tell you. How could I think it seriously? You yourself described him as a monomaniac when you fetched me to him, and we added fuel to the fire yesterday, you did, that is, with your story about the painter. It was a nice conversation, when he was, perhaps, mad on that very point. If only I'd known what happened then at the police station, and that some wretch had insulted him with this suspicion. Hmm. I would not have allowed that conversation yesterday. These monomaniacs will make a mountain out of a molehill, and see their fancies as solid realities. As far as I remember, it was Zamatov's story that cleared up half the mystery to my mind. Why, I know one case in which a hypochondriac, a man of forty, cut the throat of a little boy of eight, because he couldn't endure the jokes he made every day at table and in this case his rags, the insolent police officer, the fever, and this suspicion, all that working upon a man half frantic with hypochondria, and with his morbid exceptional vanity. That may well have been the starting point of illness. Well, bother it all. And by the way, that Zamatov certainly is a nice fellow, but, hm, he shouldn't have told all that last night. He is an awful chatterbox. But whom did he tell it to? You and me? And Porfiry. And what does that matter? And, by the way, have you any influence on them, his mother and sister? Tell them to be more careful with him today. They'll get on all right, Razumian answered reluctantly. Why is he so set against this illusion? A man with money, and she doesn't seem to dislike him, and they haven't a farthing, I suppose, eh? But what business is it of yours?" Razumian cried with annoyance. How can I tell whether they've a farthing? Ask them yourself, and perhaps you'll find out. Foo! What an ass you are sometimes! Last night's wine has not gone off yet. Good-bye. Thank your Praskovia Pavlovna from me for my night's lodging. She locked herself in, made no reply to my bonjour through the door. She was up at seven o'clock. The samovar was taken into her from the kitchen. I was not vouchsafed a personal interview. At nine o'clock precisely, Razumihin reached the lodgings at Bakaliev's house. Both ladies were waiting for him with nervous impatience. 
They had risen at seven o'clock or earlier. He entered looking as black as night, bowed awkwardly, and was at once furious with himself for it. He had reckoned without his host. Pulcheria Alexandrovna fairly rushed at him, seized him by both hands, and was almost kissing them. He glanced timidly at Avdotya Romanovna, but her proud countenance wore at that moment an expression of such gratitude and friendliness, such complete and unlooked-for respect, in place of the sneering looks and ill-disguised contempt he had expected, that it threw him into greater confusion than if he had been met with abuse. Fortunately, there was a subject for conversation, and he made haste to snatch at it. Hearing that everything was going well, and that Rodya had not yet waked, Pulcheria Alexandrovna declared that she was glad to hear it, because she had something which it was very, very necessary to talk over beforehand. Then followed an inquiry about breakfast, and an invitation to have it with them. They had waited to have it with him. Evdodya Romanovna rang the bell. It was answered by a ragged, dirty waiter, and they asked him to bring tea which was served at last, but in such a dirty and disorderly way that the ladies were ashamed. Razumihin vigorously attacked the lodgings, but, remembering Luzhin, stopped in embarrassment and was greatly relieved by Pulcheria Alexandrovna's questions, which showered in a continual stream upon him. He talked for three-quarters of an hour, being constantly interrupted by their questions, and succeeded in describing to them all the most important facts he knew of the last year of Raskolnikov's life, concluding with a circumstantial account of his illness. He omitted, however, many things, which were better omitted, including the scene at the police station with all its consequences. They listened eagerly to his story, and when he thought he had finished and satisfied his listeners, he found that they considered he had hardly begun. "'Tell me, tell me, what do you think? Excuse me, I still don't know your name,' Pulcheria Alexandrovna put in hastily. "'Dmitri Prokovitch. I should like very, very much to know, Dmitri Prokovitch, how he looks, on things in general now, that is, how can I explain, what are his likes and dislikes? Is he always so irritable? Tell me, if you can, what are his hopes, and, so to speak, his dreams? Under what influences is he now? In a word, I should like—" "'Ah, mother, how can he answer all that at once?' observed Donya. "'Good heavens! I had not expected to find him in the least like this, Dmitri Prokovitch.' Naturally, answered Razumian, I have no mother, but my uncle comes every year, and almost every time he can scarcely recognize me, even in appearance, though he is a clever man, and your three years' separation means a great deal. What am I to tell you? I have known Rodian for a year and a half. He is morose, gloomy, proud, and haughty, and of late, and perhaps for a long time before, he has been suspicious and fanciful. He has a noble nature and a kind heart. He does not like showing his feelings, and would rather do a cruel thing than open his heart freely. Sometimes, though, he is not at all morbid, but simply cold and inhumanly callous. It's as though he were alternating between two characters. Sometimes he is fearfully reserved. He says he is so busy that everything is a hindrance, and yet he lies in bed doing nothing. He doesn't jeer at things, not because he hasn't the wit, but as though he hadn't time to waste on such trifles. He never listens to what is said to him. He is never interested in what interests other people at any given moment. He thinks very highly of himself, and perhaps he is right. Well, what more? I think your arrival will have a most beneficial influence upon him." God grant it may! cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna, distressed by Razumian's account of her Rodya. And Razumian ventured to look more boldly at Avdotya Romanovna at last. He glanced at her often while he was talking, but only for a moment, and looked away again at once. Avdotya Romanovna sat at the table, listening attentively, then got up again and began walking to and fro with her arms folded and her lips compressed occasionally putting in a question, without stopping her walk. She had the same habit of not listening to what was said. She was wearing a dress of thin dark stuff, and she had a white transparent scarf round her neck. Razumian soon detected signs of extreme poverty in their belongings. 
Had Evdotya Romanovna been dressed like a queen, he felt that he would not be afraid of her. But perhaps just because she was poorly dressed, and that he noticed all the misery of her surroundings, his heart was filled with dread and he began to be afraid of every word he uttered, every gesture he made, which was very trying for a man who already felt diffident. "'You've told us a great deal that is interesting about my brother's character, and have told it impartially. I am glad. I thought that you were too uncritically devoted to him.' observed Avdotya Romanovna with a smile. "'I think you are right that he needs a woman's care,' she added thoughtfully. "'I didn't say so, but I dare say you are right. Only—' "'What?' "'He loves no one, and perhaps he never will,' Brazumian declared decisively. "'You mean he is not capable of love?' "'Do you know, Avdotya Romanovna, you are awfully like your brother, in everything indeed.' he blurted out suddenly, to his own surprise, but remembering at once what he had just before said of her brother, he turned as red as a crab and was overcome with confusion. Avdotya Romanovna couldn't help laughing when she looked at him. "'You may both be mistaken about Rodya,' Pocheria Alexandrovna remarked, slightly piqued. "'I am not talking of our present difficulty, Donya. What Pyotr Petrovitch writes in his letter, and what you and I have supposed, may be mistaken. But you can't imagine, Dmitri Prokovitch, how moody and, so to say, capricious he is. I never could depend on what he would do when he was only fifteen. And I am sure that he might do something now that nobody else would think of doing. Well, for instance, do you know how a year and a half ago he astounded me and gave me a shock that nearly killed me when he had the idea of marrying that girl—what was her name—his landlady's daughter? Did you hear about that affair?" asked Avdotya Romanovna. Do you suppose, Pocheria Alexandrovna continued warmly, do you suppose that my tears, my entreaties, my illness, my possible death from grief, our poverty would have made him pause? No, he would calmly have disregarded all obstacles. And yet it isn't that he doesn't love us. He has never spoken a word of that affair to me. Razumian answered cautiously. But I did hear something from Praskovia Pavlovna herself, though she is by no means a gossip. And what I heard certainly was rather strange. And what did you hear? both the ladies asked at once. Well, nothing very special. I only learned that the marriage, which only failed to take place through the girl's death, was not at all to Praskovia Pavlovna's liking. They say, too, the girl was not at all pretty, in fact, I am told, positively ugly. And such an invalid, and queer. But she seems to have had some good qualities. She must have had some good qualities, or it's quite inexplicable. She had no money either, and he wouldn't have considered her money, but it's always difficult to judge in such matters." "'I am sure she was a good girl,' Evdotya Romanovna observed briefly. God forgive me, I simply rejoiced at her death, though I don't know which of them would have caused most misery to the other, he to her or she to him," Pulcheria Alexandrovna concluded. Then she began tentatively questioning him about the scene on the previous day with Luzhin, hesitating and continually glancing at Donya, obviously to the latter's annoyance. This incident more than all the rest evidently caused her uneasiness, even consternation. Razumian described it in detail again, but this time he added his own conclusions. He openly blamed Raskolnikov for intentionally insulting Pyotr Petrovitch, not seeking to excuse him on the score of his illness. He had planned it before his illness, he added. I think so, too, Polcheria Alexandrovna agreed with a dejected air. But she was very much surprised at hearing Razumian express himself so carefully and even with a certain respect about Pyotr Petrovitch. Avdotya Romanovna, too, was struck by it. "'So this is your opinion of Pyotr Petrovitch?' Polcheria Alexandrovna could not resist asking. "'I can have no other opinion of your daughter's future husband,' Razumian answered firmly and with warmth. "'And I don't say it simply from vulgar politeness, but because—' "'Simply because—' 
Avdotya Romanovna has of her own free will deigned to accept this man. If I spoke so rudely of him last night, it was because I was disgustingly drunk, and mad besides. Yes, mad, crazy, I lost my head completely, and this morning I am ashamed of it." He crimsoned and ceased speaking. Avdotya Romanovna flushed, but did not break the silence. She had not uttered a word from the moment they began to speak of illusion. Without her support, Pulcheria Alexandrovna obviously did not know what to do. At last, faltering and continually glancing at her daughter, she confessed that she was exceedingly worried by one circumstance. "'You see, Dmitri Prokovitch,' she began, "'I'll be perfectly open with Dmitri Prokovitch, Donya. "'Of course, mother,' said Avdotya Romanovna emphatically. "'This is what it is,' she began in haste, as though the permission to speak of her trouble lifted a weight off her mind. "'Very early this morning we got a note from Pyotr Petrovitch in reply to our letter announcing our arrival. He promised to meet us at the station, you know. Instead of that he sent a servant to bring us the address of these lodgings, and to show us the way. And he sent a message that he would be there himself this morning. But this morning this note came from him. You'd better read it yourself. There is one point in it which worries me very much. You will soon see what that is, and... Tell me your candid opinion, Dmitri Prokovitch. You know Rodia's character better than anyone, and no one can advise us better than you can. Donya, I must tell you, made her decision at once, but I still don't feel sure how to act, and I... I've been waiting for your opinion." Razumian opened the note which was dated the previous evening and read as follows. Dear Madam Polcheria Alexandrovna, I have the honor to inform you that Owing to unforeseen obstacles, I was rendered unable to meet you at the railway station. I sent a very competent person with the same object in view. I likewise shall be deprived of the honor of an interview with you tomorrow morning by business in the Senate that does not admit of delay, and also that I may not intrude on your family circle while you are meeting your son, and Avdotya Romanovna her brother. I shall have the honor of visiting you and paying you my respects at your lodgings not later than tomorrow evening at eight o'clock precisely, and herewith I venture to present my earnest and, I may add, imperative request that Rodion Romanovitch may not be present at our interview, as he offered me a gross and unprecedented affront on the occasion of my visit to him in his illness yesterday. And, moreover, since I desire from you, personally, an indispensable and circumstantial explanation upon a certain point, in regard to which I wish to learn your own interpretation. I have the honor to inform you, in anticipation, that if, in spite of my request, I meet Rodion Romanovitch, I shall be compelled to withdraw immediately, and then you have only yourself to blame. I write on the assumption that Rodion Romanovitch, who appeared so ill at my visit, suddenly recovered two hours later and so, being able to leave the house, may visit you also. I was confirmed in that belief by the testimony of my own eyes in the lodging of a drunken man who was run over and has since died, to whose daughter, a young woman of notorious behavior, he gave twenty-five roubles on the pretext of the funeral, which gravely surprised me, knowing what pains you were at to raise that sum. Herewith expressing my special respect to your estimable daughter, Avdotya Romanovna, I beg you to accept the respectful homage of your humble servant, P. Luzhin." "'What am I to do now, Dmitri Prokovitch?' began Polcheria Alexandrovna, almost weeping. "'How can I ask Rodya not to come? Yesterday he insisted so earnestly on our refusing Pyotr Petrovitch, and now we are ordered not to receive Rodya he will come on purpose if he knows, and what will happen then?" "'Act on Avdotya Romanovna's decision,' Razumian answered calmly at once. "'Oh, dear me! She says—goodness knows what she says, she doesn't explain her object. She says that it would be best—at least not that it would be best, but that it's absolutely necessary that Rodya should make a point of being here at eight o'clock and that they must meet. I didn't want even to show him the letter, but to prevent him from coming by some stratagem with your help, because he is so irritable. 
Besides, I don't understand about that drunkard who died, and that daughter, and how he could have given the daughter all the money, which—' "'Which cost you such sacrifice, mother?' put in Avdotya Romanovna. "'He was not himself yesterday,' Razumian said thoughtfully. "'If you only knew what he was up to in a restaurant yesterday, though there was sense in it, too. Hm. He did say something, as we were going home yesterday evening, about a dead man and a girl, but I didn't understand a word. But last night, I myself—' "'The best thing, mother, will be for us to go to him ourselves, and there, I assure you, we will see at once what's to be done. Besides, it's getting late. Good heavens, it's past ten she cried, looking at a splendid gold-enameled watch which hung round her neck on a thin Venetian chain, and looked entirely out of keeping with the rest of her dress. A present from her fiancé, thought Razumian. "'We must start, Donya, we must start!' her mother cried in a flutter. "'He will be thinking we are still angry after yesterday, from our coming so late. Merciful heavens!' While she said this, she was hurriedly putting on her hat and mantle. Donya too put on her things. Her gloves, as Razumian noticed, were not merely shabby, but had holes in them, and yet this evident poverty gave the two ladies an air of special dignity, which is always found in people who know how to wear poor clothes. Razumian looked reverently at Donya and felt proud of escorting her. The queen who mended her stockings in prison, he thought, must have looked then every inch a queen and even more a queen than at sumptuous banquets and levees. "'My God!' exclaimed Pulcheria Alexandrovna. "'Little did I think that I should ever fear seeing my son, my darling, darling Rodya. I am afraid, Dmitri Prokovitch,' she added, glancing at him timidly. "'Don't be afraid, mother,' said Donya, kissing her. "'Better have faith in him.' "'Oh, dear, I have faith in him. But I haven't slept all night!" exclaimed the poor woman. They came out into the street. Do you know, Donya, when I dozed a little this morning, I dreamed of Marfa Petrovna. She was all in white. She came up to me, took my hand, and shook her head at me, but so sternly as though she were blaming me. Is that a good omen? Oh, dear me! You don't know, Dmitri Prokovitch, that Marfa Petrovna's dead. No, I didn't know. Who is Marfa Petrovna? She died suddenly, and only fancy—" "'Afterwards, Mama," put in Donya, "'he doesn't know who Marfa Petrovna is.' "'Ah, you don't know? And I was thinking that you knew all about us. Forgive me, Dmitri Prokovitch, I don't know what I am thinking about these last few days. I look upon you really as a providence for us, and so I took it for granted that you knew all about us. I look on you as a relation. Don't be angry with me for saying so. Dear me, what's the matter with your right hand? Have you knocked it?" "'Yes, I bruised it,' muttered Razumian, overjoyed. "'I sometimes speak too much from the heart, so that Donya finds fault with me. But dear me, what a cupboard he lives in! I wonder whether he is awake. Does this woman, this landlady, consider it a room? Listen, you say he does not like to show his feelings so perhaps I shall annoy him with my weaknesses? Do advise me, Dmitri Prokovitch, how am I to treat him? I feel quite distracted, you know." Don't question him too much about anything if you see him frown. Don't ask him too much about his health. He doesn't like that. Ah, Dmitri Prokovitch, how hard it is to be a mother! But here are the stairs. What an awful staircase! "'Mother, you are quite pale. Don't distress yourself, darling,' said Donya, caressing her. Then, with flashing eyes, she added, "'He ought to be happy at seeing you, and you are tormenting yourself so.' "'Wait, I'll peep in and see whether he is waked up.' The lady slowly followed Razumian, who went on before, and when they reached the landlady's door in the fourth story, they noticed that her door was a tiny crack open and that two keen black eyes were watching them from the darkness within. When their eyes met, the door was suddenly shut with such a slam that Pulcheria Alexandrovna almost cried out. End of Part 3 Chapter 2